Nzonga, what I just said about the New Jerusalem, right? Yeah. Revelation 21 9. The angel says to John, Come, I will show you the bride, the Lamb's no, wife. No, Revelation 21 9. The angel says to John, Come, I will show you the bride, the Lamb's wife. Verse 10. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, and he showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. Angel says to John, I will show you the bride, and he shows John a city. The new Jerusalem is us. The same way that the angel tells John, look at the lion of Judah, and John sees a lamb. Other than that, there's no, Jesus isn't the lion of Judah, even though we think that he is. That's what the angels saw him as, but he's the lamb. <laughs> oh, you guys, you guys weren't here for that. You guys weren't here for that. <laughs> huh? So in Revelation, the angel tells John. I don't, wait, let me find it. <laughs> yeah, let me find it. Uh, no, it's not Jesus talking. Is it a river? Where is it? It's early revelation. I don't remember one. I don't remember where though. Which one? Yeah, lion and the lamb thing. No, chapter 21 was verses 9 and 10. Read that and you'll see what I'm talking about. No, I'm not sure it's verse 4 still. I mean, chapter 4. Whoa! Sorry, I was so confused. Like, so how, how does that show that it's us? It says, it says. So verse nine. I'll explain it in a second. One sec. Sign in then. Oh, you forget it. So verse nine, Revelation twenty-one. The angel says to him, "Come." I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. Yeah. Verse 10. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. Come, let me show you the bride. And what does he show him? A city. That city is the bride and the bride is us. We are the new Jerusalem. Yeah, I think it's Sharif. That was Revelation 21, 9 and 10. Listen, the day we get... I'm still studying Revelation. The day we get into Revelation, you man are going to throw your Bibles in. No, no I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah, so the one of the elders says to John in Revelation 5, 5, Do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose his seven seals. And John says in verse 6, And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne... And of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb. The, the elder says to John, look at the lion. But John doesn't see a lion. John sees a lamb. Because Jesus is the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. The reason they see him as a lion is because he overcame. But he overcame as the lamb. It's not that he's a lion today and roaring and trying to destroy you. And then he's a lamb tomorrow. No. He overcame... As the lamb. Does that make sense? Yeah, 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 yeah. Some people say he's the lion and the lamb. It's like, no. He's the lamb that overcame. Which is why they thought he was a lion. I love the scriptures, man. Alright, so. How much time we got? Should we do Q&A today? Alright, I'll say a little bit then. We're going to start a new series. Old and new forward to this one. We're going to wreck some theology in this place. <clears throat> a lot of Christians obviously, they don't understand the new covenant, which is what they're living in. So I see a lot of Christians that are mixing up different stuff. And if you know us, you know that I hate mixture. I hate mixture with a passion. I prefer that people are just straight old covenant and only under the law. Because when there's mixture, people think they know the new covenant. And they have bits and parts. So they, it's like when they hear the message fully, they're like, oh yeah, no, but I know that. I don't know you don't, if you, or you don't believe it, because if you did, you wouldn't be saying what you're saying or whatever. So what we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to begin to rightly divide Old and New Covenant. So let's go to John 1.17. And we are going to... 
are going to look at the Old Covenant. Just to clarify, when I say the Old Covenant, well, this verse won't explain it, but we're talking about the Law and the Prophets, so from Moses until Christ. You guys there? Let's read. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Yeah, I just basically explained that before I read it. Now we're going to go to... Let's go to Deuteronomy 6, 25. I'm going to rush through this so you guys can ask me questions. Deuteronomy 6, 25. In fact, no, let's read from verse 24. <laughs> Everybody there? Yeah. All right, let's read. And the Lord commanded us to observe all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God for our good always, that he might preserve us alive as it is this day. Then it will be righteousness for us, if we are careful to observe all these commandments before the Lord our God, as he has commanded us. We looked at this in the Righteousness series, that verse 25. So under the old covenant, it's supposed to be the law, that, fulfilling that law, keeping that law was meant to bring them righteousness. So we're having this in mind, right? Old and new. Let's go to Exodus 19. I'm going to read verses 5 and 6. Exodus 19, 5 and 6. You guys there? Let's read. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. So we see that this covenant between God and Israel is very, very conditional on their behavior. It's all about if you do this, then I will do this. This is God speaking. If you do this, then I will do this. And that is the language of the old covenant. That's one of the ways we can divide. Who does it start with? If it's you do this so that God can do that, it's probably old covenant. Even when we come, when it comes to Jesus, some Christians will be told them that they're already forgiven. They struggle because in Matthew 6, in the Lord's Prayer, it says, you know, forgive us as we forgive others. So it's like, well, and then he even says afterwards, if we don't forgive anybody, if we don't forgive others, God won't forgive us. And I'm like, that's old covenant though. Because in the old covenant, it was always conditioned. God wouldn't do anything unless you did something. That's the language of the Old Covenant is, you do, and then I will do. That's what God says in the Old Covenant. You do this, and then I will do this. I'm going to look at how that changes in the New. Well, let's go to Deuteronomy 30, verse 16. Deuteronomy 30. Yeah, 30, verse 16. Let's read. In that I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways, and to keep his commandments, his statutes, and his judgments, that you may live and multiply, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land which you go to possess. So even the blessings that they're meant to receive from God are totally dependent on their behavior. So they have to keep deeper, yeah? It's not even just they have to keep the ten. He says the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments. So I'm pretty sure this is the end of Deuteronomy, so I'm pretty sure they have, like, how many laws? There's 613 in total, so they probably have them all by now. And you have to keep all of these so that you may live and multiply and so that God may bless you. 
How many Christians in church go to, in fact, we're going to go there in a second, Deuteronomy 28. I say, you know, if you serve God, this is the blessing that God gives you. <laughs> and they miss what it says. That you only qualify for the fact, let's go there now. Deuteronomy 28, verse 15. Try and blaze through this. Oh, sorry, no. Well, you know, Jesus told me 28, 15, but I'll give you some context. So you know that, in fact, everybody knows Fred Hammond blessed. We're blessed in the sea, we're blessed in the field, we're blessed everywhere. All that, that's from Jesus told me 28. Those are the blessings that come. The problem is, we're going to read verse 15. You guys there? All right, let's read. But it shall come to pass, if you do not obey the voice of the Lord your God, to observe carefully all his commandments and his statutes, which I command you today, that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. Cursed in the city. We don't sing that one, do we? <laughs> huh? Cursed in the field. Cursed, the curse, 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 curse. You know, there's, there's five times more curses than blessings in the law. And the way that you qualify for those curses is if you do not observe carefully all. So if you break one straight curse... So we want to be blessed in the field, blessed in the city, blessed in the world. I hope you kept the law perfectly. Because if you're not, you're cursed, 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 cursed. Five times more cursed than you would have been blessed. You might are going to start throwing your songs away too. Sorry, guys. Let's go to Joshua 1. I'm going to read verses 7 to 8. Do you want to charge your phone? <laughs> I'm sure most of you have heard this before. You guys there? Joshua, Joshua 1, verses 7 to 8. You, you guys have definitely heard verse 8. And I know it's been preached in your churches. And they told you that you need to do this. The problem is, they didn't show you what's in verse 7. All right, that's why we're reading from verse 7, all right? Let's go. Only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law, all the law, which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. So you don't want to live by this scripture, yeah? You don't better start studying Leviticus, Deuteronomy, <laughs> Exodus, Numbers. You want to qualify for this? You start, no, not only do you study all of it, observe to do all of it, do not turn from it to the right or to the left. Don't even let it leave your mouth. So you should always be saying it, meditating on it. Meditate on the law. This is what we preach on Sundays. As, as, God's, as the Rema word from God that we should be meditating on the ministry of death that we should, we should speak the ministry of death old and new now one nice way of rightly dividing right is <laughs> now obviously we know that the old covenant is obsolete which we'll get to in a bit but the principle here is something that we can take. So we're told to meditate. Joshua was told to meditate on what he had, which was the law. What we do in the new covenant is we meditate on who we are in Christ. We meditate on the new covenant, on the promises. That's why we do all these confessions. That is basically the new covenant version of what Joshua was meant to do. I am a new creation. All things have passed away. All things are new. All things are mirror of God. I am reconciled to God by Jesus Christ. God has given me. All those things that we're saying, that we're doing, that's the new covenant version. But if you're not doing that, if that's not what you're confessing, you're wasting your time. What's the next one? Oh, lovely. Psalm 119 for all you worshippers. <laughs> you worshippers that want to wanna be like David, be, be men and women after God's own heart, right? Like you're not in God's heart already. Oh, you didn't know that's what it meant by you're your, your hidden with Christ in God. Okay. 
Psalm 119, that will hit some of you when you get home. Psalm 119, verse 160. Ah! I just need this whole, this whole chapter is about the Lord. <laughs> Lord! <laughs> this whole chapter is about the Lord. Ah, oh, Jesus is Lord. Let's just, let's just pick and choose a couple verses, shall we? <laughs> Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with the whole heart. You have commanded us to keep your precepts diligently. Oh, that my ways were directed to keep your statutes. Remember I told you that David sinned more than Saul. <laughs> Let's go to Psalm 19, 160. You guys there? Oh. All right, let's read. The entirety of your word is truth, and every one of your righteous judgments endures forever. I'm going to show you that David was wrong here. I mean, it's Hebrews 8.13. The, the old covenant, which is this law, is obsolete. Endures forever. How long is forever then? Old and new. We have to remember that the old covenant guys did not have the full revelation. They spoke in parts. What they could see in part. We have the full revelation in Christ. Same chapter. We're going to read verse 165. And then we'll, uh, we'll go for some new stuff and then round up. All right, you guys there? Oh, let's read this. Great peace have those who love your law and nothing causes them to stumble. Well, hold on, David. When you saw Bathsheba, what did you do? <laughs> How many wives did David have, by the way? <laughs> <laughs> they weren't meant to go into the temple, right? But David took him and his boys and they went and ate the showbread. But what does he say? Those who love the law. He says, David himself said, I've, I've, I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. And yet he was sinning left and right. You still want to be like David, guys? You want to be a man after God's heart? You better start sinning. <laughs> no, yeah. We'll, we'll show you. I'll show you why this was wrong. Let's go to Romans 7. This old and new thing is so beautiful. Fam. Thank God we didn't exist then. <laughs> it's all finished. Romans 7, verses 7 and 8. You guys there? Romans 7, 7 and 8. Let's read. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. For I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, You shall not covet. But sin, taking opportunity by the commandment, produced in me all manner of evil desire. For apart from the law, sin was dead. Let's read verse 10. And the commandment, which was to bring life, I found to bring death. Verse 11 even. For sin, taken occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it killed me. So all this meditating on the law that David is doing, thinking that it's going to keep him from sinning. Paul tells us with the full revelation, that's the opposite of what the law does. The law produces sin in you. That's what Romans 7 is about, by the way. Romans 7 is not some Christian that's, oh, I want to do this, but I don't, oh, I don't want to do this, and I'm doing this, and I don't. That's not. That's what happens when, the, when you live under the law. That's what the whole chapter is about, the law. The law cannot save you from sin, because the purpose of the law is to reveal sin. The Lord of Paul says, he says, all right, I didn't know about coveting. I didn't know I was a covetous man until I read in the law. You shall not covet. And then all of a sudden, I, just, I was just coveting bare. That's what the law does. So all that meditation on the law that they were doing, 
thinking that's what was going to make them righteous, thinking that's what was going to make them live right. They didn't know that they were just producing sin, 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 sin and killing themselves. You know what it says, the letter kills but the spirit gives life? You know what that letter is? Old and new. Old and new, baby. All right, let's go to Romans 10, verse 4. I'm going to show you some of the new stuff now. You guys up? Let's read. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Remember Romans, uh, Deuteronomy 6.25? If we keep this, then we're going to be righteous. Christ comes and shuts that up. Is that up? That's ended now. You trying to keep right, you trying to be righteous by the law? No, nah, that doesn't work. I've ended that. Remember, I told you that the Lord died with Christ. For us who believe, you were here for the righteousness series. If not, again, on the Google Drive, we did six weeks on it. Our righteousness is by faith, not by the works of the law. In fact, let's go to Galatians 2.16. We looked at this in the righteousness week, one of the weeks. It's always fun to revisit this stuff, though. You guys up? Let's read. Knowing that a man is not justified. That word justified means made righteous. Let's read it again. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Let's just stop there. In fact, no, no, let's read because it gets even better. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. It's impossible for you to be made righteous by keeping the law. But we have Christians that are still trying to keep the law. That's why they tell me that I can't wear this in church. That's why they tell you you can't get tattoos. You know where they got that from? The law. Why do I keep doing that? I'll leave this here. All that stuff, you asked me today about tattoos, right? I was like, cool, go get a tattoo. I'm not under the law, you're not under the law. <laughs> she said, in fact, she asked, me, she asked me if it was wrong. I was like, sure, if you were a Jew living a, a few thousand years ago. I mean, you, let's, let's be real. Are you telling me that on judgment day, you're going to come before God and he's going to be like, what's that on your skin? Hell. <laughs> <laughs> that's, no, but that's essentially what we're saying. That because I have these in my ear, I'm on a path to hell. And, and, and apparently, if I just take them out, I'm back on the path to heaven. <laughs> like, let's, well, let's really think about what we're saying. Let's really think about it. <laughs> let's think about it. It's not like my ear heals up and it was like, no. I've had these in for years. So I just take these out. So if Jesus, let's say that if Jesus is coming now and he's descending through the sky, if I just take these out, I'm going up. But if I leave them in, I'm staying here. And we think that makes sense. <laughs> oh my God. Religion is funny. <laughs> Ooh. Yeah, 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 all right. Let's go to Hebrews 7, 22. I love the new covenant, man. Oh. Better covenant. It really is a better covenant. Hebrews 7, 22. I can't wait till we come here and look at tithing. <laughs> you guys there? This is one of my favorite books, man. Hebrews is a banger. All right, let's read. By so much more, Jesus has become a surety of a better covenant. Some other versions say that he's the guarantee of the new covenant. Remember in the old covenant, it was you that had to make everything happen. You live right, then God will do this. You do this. So basically, the old covenant was dependent on you and what you did. You were the guarantee of that covenant. You did everything right, congratulations, everything's awarded to you. You mess up, you don't get any of it. You get cursed instead. 
In this covenant, the guarantee is not us. Jesus is our covenant. Jesus is our guarantee. He is the one that ensures that this thing happens. It's not us, it's Christ. Your works don't make you righteous. Christ's works make you righteous. Your works don't make you holy. Christ makes you holy. You don't make yourself anything. Christ makes you everything. Mm -hmm. I tweet that, man. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go to Ephesians 1.3. Oh, man. You just get drunk off this stuff, man. <laughs> <laughs> Remember we read in <laughs> Ephesians 1 3. You know this one. We read in Deuteronomy 30, 16. That all those blessings, blessing the city, bless, 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 bless. That was dependent on keeping the law perfectly. Now let's see what, what that looks like in the new covenant. You guys there? Yeah. Ephesians 1 3. Let us read. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. See the tense, let's, let's look at the tense of that. Does it say who is blessing us? Does it say who will bless us? It says who has blessed us. Past tense. You have been blessed already with every, every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. You're not working to get blessings from God. Next time a man of God tells you to come to the altar for blessings of God, tell him go read his scriptures again. <laughs> to get more spiritual power, to get more anointing, to get... No. <laughs> that is not in this book. You have already been blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You're already holy. You're already righteous. You've already been made perfect. You've already been sanctified, you've been called, you've been justified, you've been all these things. Past tense, you have been these things. And the qualification for that, you're in Christ. That's all it was. And how do you get in Christ? You believe. That's it. It's not because you prayed and fasted. It's certainly not because you kept the law. You qualify for this the moment you believe. The moment you believe, your bank account is rich. Let's go to Galatians 3.13. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Galatians 3, this, this will be our last one. And then we'll do a little bit of questions for about 10 minutes. You guys there? Galatians 3.13. Fam? Fam? <laughs> Everybody there? Let's read. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on the tree. Guess where that's written? There's only one place it's going to be written, man. Where do you not get cursed in this book? In the law. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. You trying to keep that law? You know, I was thinking about it. I was thinking this is the reason why even Christians that are trying to keep the law don't suffer the curses that they're meant to suffer. This Christ has redeemed us from it, even if you're not aware of it. We don't understand what Christ has done, fam. Oh my God. Christ. Ah. Oh. He does a good job at what he does. And Christ actually became a curse for us. Oh, oh, you know it says who God has blessed, no man can curse. And God came down and became a curse. For who? Not for himself, for us. And people think that, oh, God, um, God doesn't love sinners. No, we were, none of us were born again when he did that. Everyone was a sinner. Everyone was his enemy. And he became a curse so that you could join. Oh my goodness. 
I will di- I will fight that doctrine to the day I die. Rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> and just so you know that I wasn't talking much about what David said, let's go to Hebrews eight thirteen. Then we have time for a couple questions and we'll round up. You guys there? Hebrews 8.13. You must be there now, surely. All right, let's read. In that he says, a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete. Now what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. We'll go into the last bit soon. Remember what I said about AD 70? Right, I'll put it to you this way. I didn't realize this until I've learned this. If you don't notice that if you ask a Jew what tribe they're from, they won't be able to tell you. You know how like, there's like the 12 tribes and it's all through scripture. The, the Jews now, they, they don't know what tribe they're from. They all just have what they, I don't know, I don't know what it's called, but you know, they all wear that stuff. There's no, there's no high priest. There are no priests. They don't do those sacrifices. You never wonder like why Judaism today doesn't look anything like the Judaism of the Bible. Because what happened in AD 70 was Rome came in and destroyed the temple. And so the Jews were really good at keeping records. They destroyed all the records. So no one knows what tribe they're from. But the point that this was written, that destruction hadn't happened yet. Now all the Christians knew from Jesus' prophecy that this day was coming. So when um, Josephus, who is a who was a Jewish historian, wrote about the destruction of a temple, and he said that when they completely ransacked Jerusalem, all the stuff about like, woe to the person that has babies and stuff like that, that stuff happened. People had to eat their babies because false messiahs came in. Remember the false messiahs in that day, there'll be many that say, I'm the messiah. False messiahs came and said, I'm the messiah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna overthrow the Romans. They failed. One particular guy got them to lock, basically lock themselves in the city and eventually they ran out of food. So they had nothing to eat. That's why they ate babies. Thing is, there were no Christians that died in the, in the ransacking of Jerusalem. And Joseph, as a Jewish historian, said because they remembered what the Lord had prophesied. They all left the city. When they saw the sign, I think he said the signs, you know all the stuff about like the stars falling and blah, 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 blah. Was, I've forgotten the exact one, but he's like, Jesus mentioned something that was, this is what, Jesus is a prophet's prophet, fam. He's, the accuracy is incredible. I forgot, I have to find it, maybe we'll look at it next week, but what he described as a sign was basically on the shield of the Romans. So he was like, when you see this, whatever you see, when you see it surrounding the city, you'll know to leave. So when they looked and they saw the Romans were coming with whatever that sign was surrounding the city, they cut. No Christians died in AD 70. No Christians died when they destroyed. So when it says the old covenant is obsolete, the old covenant had been made obsolete because Christ had been crucified and everything and the Lord died with him. But the reason it was growing obsolete and passing away was because people were still able to do all those sacrifices at that point. Once the temple was destroyed, you couldn't do sacrifices anymore. So for us, this has vanished away. Any questions? Let's round up. It's crazy. AD 70 is one of the... I said it's one of the most important things that we should know. And no one in our circles teaches about it. It will radically change how you view scripture. They're like, to the point where this is this affects how a lot of people interpret everything in Revelation. Because some people think Revelation is about AD 70. So they, t- they take the Antichrist to be Nero. Emperor Nero. Emperor Nero who had a mark that everybody had to take. And if you didn't take the mark, you were killed. <laughs> oh, what do we do with that? What do we do with actual history? This isn't some Jamaican man that went to hell and had a vision and saw the devil. No, 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 no. This is actual fact documented that this is what people did. There was a mark. People had to take it. So, remember, Jesus didn't just randomly teach them how to pray. Why did he ask? Oh, sorry. The question was, why did Jesus teach the Lord's Prayer? First of all, it's not the Lord's Prayer because Jesus didn't pray like that. But yeah, that's the question. He was answering a question, remember? 
the, the I'm pretty sure the disciples came to us and said, Lord, teach us how to pray. Yeah. He's like, all right, cool. You want to pray? Pray like this. Kay's not here. I wish he were here. But he was like, if we were, if it were a new covenant prayer, it would begin with our Father who is in us. <laughs> Some people cling on like this. We're gonna. In fact, we might even, when it comes to old and new, we might have to deal with what Jesus says because a lot of people get mixture from Jesus' words because what Jesus was doing was he was transitioning people from the old into the new. So some of the stuff he says is still old, some of the stuff he said was timeless, and some of the stuff he said was new. But if you're not able to divide that, you'll take one old covenant thing and think, oh, well, that's what I should live by. The example is um, living by the law. They ask him, how do you sum up the law? How do you read the law? He says, love God, love your neighbor. The law that we've seen is a ministry of death, condemnation, kills, produces sin, all this stuff. And he says, all right, yeah, if you want to sum it up, love God, love your neighbor. That's the greatest thing in the, in the law. And everybody's like, oh, well, let's do that then. Christians, now. I'm like, well, let's do that. Thinking that that's what they're meant to do. They're pursuing the, the ministry of death that condemns and kills you. Just because it came out of Jesus' mouth. And they didn't realize why he said it. Makes a huge difference. This right division thing, understanding that not everything Jesus said was to you was for you first of all nothing jesus really said was for us the bible isn't even written to us the bible is a collection of writings to different people at different times that apply to us and we need to maybe stop reading the bible like god is speaking every word to you you know i was talking to this yeah i might have to pause this fam <laughs> I was talking to uh, Francis earlier, one of the elders of the platform, about um, 2 Timothy 3, 2 Timothy 3, 16, which is all scripture. In your Bible, it will say, all scripture is God-breathed. And all scripture is God-breathed and is inspired. Well, no, it's all scripture is God-breathed or inspired and is profitable for blah, 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 blah. And basically, if you actually look in the Greek, the real translation of that is every God-breathed writing or every inspired writing is profitable for blah, blah, blah. But then the next question is always, well, does that mean that not all scripture is God-breathed? And obviously most Christians can't say that. They're like... But I mean, like, let's... Like, if all scripture is God-breathed, all scripture, all scripture, and we have to... Because it says all. It doesn't say some. or No, it says all. <clears throat> if your Bible says that every single scripture is God-breathed, every single scripture, right? Bear in mind that there are scriptures in... So when, when Paul wrote that, it didn't even say scripture said writings, so it's long. But basically, their Bible was longer than our Bible. Some of the writings that they had then, we don't have in our Bibles now. They could have had um, the book of Enoch in there, because Jude quotes from it. Their Old Testament had Wisdom of Solomon. This is a really good book. We've, we've read some of it, by the way. Really, really good book. Not in our Bibles, though, because some people in our circle from our... Um, Denomination didn't like it, they cut it out. So even when he says every God be writing, he could have meant wisdom of Solomon was in there, and we don't. Some people say, oh yeah, but the Bible, which Bible, bro? Because if you're Orthodox, your Bible is different to if you're Catholic, which is a different Bible to if you're Protestant. So your Bible's right and theirs is wrong, or theirs is right, and I don't understand. Probably whether we should be, oh, what? No, yeah. No, we should be the safest in it because we have the shortest Bible. So we have what everybody else has, and then they have some extra ones. So we're, I guess we're safe. But all right, every 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 single scripture is God breathed, right? Let's just go to the Book of Job. Um, this shouldn't be hard. Every single scripture is God breathed. Mm mm. Where's your give and take away? Or though you slay me? It's definitely enjoyable. Let me find it. Job. Job one what? That's the... You give and take away. So, every scripture is God breathed, right? Every single one. There's not a single verse that's not breathed by God, not inspired by God. So Job says about God, 
Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And God inspired that. But then, God inspires Paul to say that the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. Which means that God gives and doesn't take back. God gives and doesn't take away. James says, God inspires James to say that if you want wisdom, you can ask God that he gives all liberally. He says that God has no, um, God is the father of lights in whom there is no shadow of turning. God doesn't change his mind. Why would he give and take away? God inspired him, to, he inspired them to say those two things, right? Every single scripture is God breathed, every single one. So God inspired Job to be wrong. Because you know, when you get to the end of Job, in like, I think Job 34, maybe 42, I'll have to find it. But Job basically disqualifies everything he said before. He said, I was speaking about things I didn't know. I was waffling. But God inspired that, right? God inspired that waffle. Is that what we're saying? Is that what we're saying? This is stuff we've got, we've got, we've got, listen, man, we've got to be real. Because some of what we say does not make sense. And most people are too scared. This is the first. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put this up, man. But I'm the man that are going to say this. I'm going to put this up, man. <laughs> <laughs> this rightly dividing thing is where you're able to see, all right, what's inspired by God and how we know is through Christ. What does Christ show us? Does this line up with who Christ is? Then it was inspired by him. This doesn't quite. Some stuff we can park on the shelf. Maybe it's a little. We're not entirely sure, but some stuff is just deaf or wrong. Question. Um, I have two questions. Mm -hmm. um, like, so, what is your view of wrong doing? Because, like, com confident or no confident, like there are some things that everyone can agree to are wrong. So, like, what attitude are we supposed to have towards things that are like obviously wrong? And like, you know, even with the thing about like the way he was skinning his death, like, isn't that just like logical? Like, if you kill someone, right, it's not going to be good. Yeah, but some, okay, so to answer your second question, because in my head, some people read that verse as God pays you in debt. So basically, if you sin, God basically kills you. We have this idea that God is the one who sends us to hell. And that's not true. God literally came to save us from hell. Why would he then send us there? Jesus said, I didn't come to condemn the one, I came to save him. The wages of sin is death. We were all slaves to sin before we got saved. Jesus came to free us from the grip of sin and death. To loose us from his power. Does that make sense? You want to Essentially, know? anything in life, if you look to Christ, but if you disregard everything that doesn't look to Christ, people will tell you no, but it's 2020, man. I'm bolder this year. Yeah, man. <laughs> Try to read scripture. Honestly, if it's not Christ, I'm, I'm, I'm not interested. The, all, all, so the, script, the parts of scripture that don't um, point to Christ, you can still read them. Yeah, but like, so, okay, so remember what I said that when it looks, when we looked at Joshua 1, I was like, you know, meditate on the law, 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 law. So obviously, Christ isn't in that. But the principle is cool. I said, all right, now how do I apply this in the new covenant? So when I read scripture now, I read it through the lens of the cross. Where this is, you have to read the Bible this way or you're going you're gonna to get messed up. You read scripture, especially when you're in the old covenant. All right, did the cross change this? What I'm reading right now what did is there a new covenant does this carry through the cross did paul say something like this does it get changed does it get corrected does jesus change it does jesus match up with it these are the questions we have to be asking whenever we read scripture i know that people will tell you that your bible doesn't contradict itself i have literally started making a list of contradictions in scripture i just gave you some today the law of god is forever and then paul's like no it's obsolete bro no, there's a point. Remember I showed you the one that Paul, Paul, <laughs> Paul literally edited the Old Testament to make his point. There's a verse in, in fact, I sent it to you, innit? Oh. It's, on the, it's on the group chat. Boy, oh boy, 2020 is looking nuts. I'm about to get called there. You man are going to start seeing heresy articles on me. <laughs> <laughs> uh... Right, so in, 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 Roman, so in Isaiah 59 verse 20, it says, The Redeemer will come to Zion and to those who turn from transgression in Jacob, says the Lord. This is Isaiah 59 verse 20. 
when Paul uses the scripture to make his point, he says, and so all Israel will be saved, as it is written, as it is written, he is quoting, for deliverer will come out of Zion. Hold on, hold on, Paul. The verse actually says will come to Zion. Paul says, uh, nah, not anymore. It will come out of Zion. He will come out of Zion and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. You know, if you, if you, if you just like, we read our Bibles with our brains switched off. Yeah. Oh, no, no, honestly, we see something that doesn't make sense. We're like, yeah, well, his ways are higher than our ways. So I will never understand it. Uh, you know, blessed be the name of the Lord. Bless you, man. God, catch my train. Last year, last year was the year I, I decided to start reading like with my brain on, and I was like, "No, like, I have the mind of Christ. Like, it's okay to think." Like people, 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 we've 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 made thinking so wrong that it's almost like, well, I remember people tweeting about thinking like tampers with your faith. But we 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 preach about like don't think too much, don't overthink it, because then you'll 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 go into unbelief. Well, no, I have the mind of Christ. If I think with the mind of Christ and I dissect scripture properly, my faith, my faith has been strengthened from thinking. I know Christ better now because I actually thought through the stuff I was reading. I was like, well, hold on. If Jesus is the perfect revelation of God, then why am I listening to anybody else talk about who God is? If I want to know what God is like, I have to look to Jesus. And then I, what we do is we take Jesus and try and match him to the God of the Old Testament. That's not how we read scripture. We take the Old Testament and match it to Christ. Christ, uh, Phil Drysdale has this really good image. He says, basically, let's take, we're doing a puzzle. We're putting it all together, right? And we don't have the picture on the box to know what the puzzle looks like. So we're just taking different pieces. Well, this is green. It must be grass. This is blue. Maybe it's the sky. Then one day, someone brings the cover of the puzzle and we actually get to see what the puzzle is. Oh, and then you see, no, this wasn't the sky, actually. This was uh, water. Oh, no, this was grass. No, no, no. That's what we do, right? The Old Testament is pieces to the puzzle. Jesus is the picture on the box. You do not read scripture trying to make sense. You don't read scripture trying to make the picture fit what you thought. Oh, no, 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 no. That's what, you know, that's what Christians do. We see Christ and we go, nah, I preferred it when this was grass. A God that's not into violence. Nah, thank you. I want a God that I want a God that smites his enemies so my enemies can fall down and die. <laughs> no, I'm not joking. This is what we do. This is what Christians do. I oh, know I'm running out of time. Christians use it's it's so interesting. I'll run a bit. I always say this, right? This um the transfiguration on the mount showed me how to read scripture. Moses and Elijah appear. That's the law and the prophets. That's the whole Old Testament. And Peter wants to make tabernacles for all three and give them all the same level. And God is like, you're not doing that. Removes the other two. He says, this is my son. Hear him. You don't know me through Moses and Elijah. They didn't see properly. Only Jesus knows me. Jesus says, no one knows the father except the son. So what do we do? We start erecting tabernacles for all three. I know Jesus said, love your enemies. But that's where Moses one time said that. That's what we do. And that's not how we do this thing. We look to Christ alone as the full representation of God. He is the clearest picture. There is not a part of God that he didn't show us in Christ. And that's what a lot of Christians struggle to grasp because the God of the Old Testament seems so different to you. And then what we're going to do is I'm going to show you the thread of Christ in the Old Testament. Some of the stuff that we read today, there were verses around it. Um, I read it and I was like, ooh, this is going to be good. Because it's in there, it's hidden in there. And this is what Jesus was doing on the road to um, Emmaus. He took the disciples after he rose and he expounded to them all that was in the scriptures concerning himself. And like, oh yeah, I mean, you've heard me do this before. Different stories about him. But he would have stuff like this. The suffering servant in Isaiah 53, that was me. That's what I just did on the cross. By his stripes, we are healed. These are the stripes, bro. That's real revelation. Not, I mean, I'm so out of that charismatic stuff, but you know, like, God, I'm going to bless you. I read, I read 
oh, I can't even do it anymore. I don't have it in me anymore. You know that was that we do in prophetic church? Reading one random prophetic book and then start trying to say that you're this and you're that. No, it's Christ alone. That's what I care about. If it's not Christ, shh. That's what Paul says. I desire to know nothing among you except Christ and him crucified. Paul, that was a, that was a scholar. Pharisee of Pharisees, he called himself. He was like, all that, all that knowledge I had, I counted it rubbish that I may know Christ, that I may gain Christ. That, all the knowledge I had of the Old Testament scriptures, all that was wonderful. Mm, it wasn't actually. I count that dung. That's the word he uses. Like actual poo. He said that is poo compared to knowing Christ. Well, that's some tough stuff. Jeez, 2020. 